Good morning. Good Good to see you all today here at the Lord's House for our worship. Please be sure to take the opportunity to sign the Black Friendship uh, booklet that's at the end of each pew, either at one of the ends of the pews, and pass it on to those that are worshiping alongside of you this morning. The order of service that we're going to follow today is printed for you in the service folder. As the season of Advent does uh, make us do a few different things in our worship life, uh, we're going to use the gathering rite, the same one we used last week, Lead Us to Your Light. I'll sing the first refrain. The congregation will repeat that refrain. I'll sing the verses. Notice also we have the responsive reading for the lighting of the Advent wreath uh, before we stand then uh, for the confession of sins. We'll remain seated uh, for the first part. The whole service, the rest of the service is also printed for you there in the service folder uh, for you to participate in the worship today. Let's then begin our service then with a gathering right. Lead us to your light. Lead us to your light, lead us out of darkness, lead us to your light, come Jesus, come, lead us to your light, lead us out of darkness, lead us to your light. Come, Jesus, come. Lord, we await your coming to our world. Bring us the gift of salvation. Lead us to your light. Lead us out of who came in history. He came into a world of sin and death. We remember Jesus who came as the promised Messiah. John the Baptist prepared the way of the Lord. We hear his call to repent. We light two Advent candles as a sign of our repentance and desire for renewal. Come Lord Jesus, be our guest. Through your word and spirit, may our souls be blessed. Rouse us from sleep, wake us from our slumber, banish the darkness of night. Lead us to your light, lead us out of darkness, lead us to your light, come Jesus Child of the light and love beyond the telling, fill our hearts with wonder and praise. Lead us through your light, lead us out of darkness, lead us. 
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lead us to your light. Lead us out of darkness. Lead us to your light. Come, Jesus Christ. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We continue to prepare for the coming of our Lord this Sunday of Advent, primarily focuses always on John the Baptist, preparing the coming, preparing for the coming of the Lord. The coming of John the Baptist, though, is prophesied for us in Scripture as well uh, in our first lesson, which we'll focus on the first five verses for the sermon in a few moments for the prophet Isaiah. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sin. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged place is a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers in the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice for the shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm is Psalm 85 on page 97 in the front part of the hymnal. We'll sing the verses of the psalm responsively by the half verse. Oh, 
coming of the Lord is imminent, and therefore we must be prepared for his coming. Lesson from 2 Peter chapter 3. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. All mankind will see God's salvation. Hallelujah. Please stand. The Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1. The beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Be seated. The hymn of the day is hymn number 16 on Jordan's Bank, the Baptist Cry.
Come, gracious Lord. Our hearts are good. Our sins forgive. Our foes suppress. Our roots and enmity subdue. And crown your gospel with success. Amen. Without a doubt, many of you can recall the big hoopla that was going on two years ago. When everybody thought, not everybody, but many thought the world was going to end. 12, 12, 20, 12. It was all over the news. What you probably don't remember is that almost exactly one year before that, there was other news that broke. A Euro European archaeologist had determined that that Mayan inscription was not referring to some apocalyptic event that was going to end the world, but simply a figurative ex explanation of the coming Mayan deity. So the world's not going to end. The movie had already been released and still raked in millions. This was certainly not welcome news by, hope, by those that were hoping the end would come on December 12, 2012. And it's certainly a waste of time for those that actually thought something might happen that day and did something to prepare. Of course, to us, it was all foolishness. Because our Lord has even made clear to us that he doesn't know in his humility what that day will be. So how in the world can the Mayans know what that day will be? But now, we wait for his coming. Because we know he's coming. Certainly we don't know when, as the Apostle told us, for the thousand years is like a day to God, and the day is like a thousand years, but we know it's coming. And in our Advent reflection, we see the two comings of, of Jesus, kind of one behind the other one. We long for his second coming as we wait the imminent first coming that we're about to celebrate. Now as John the Baptist was doing his work to prepare God's people, he of course was doing it because the Lord was already walking on this earth. He was about to begin his earthly ministry. And John was preparing his people, God's people, with the message of repentance prior to the coming of our Lord. And as we know that John the Baptist is the fulfillment of what we heard in Isaiah as we focus on these words now for a moment, we see that the coming of the Savior gives us so much to look forward to. When the Savior comes, he brings desperately needed comfort. And we wouldn't want to miss his coming. And so we, as we do in Advent, make ourselves ready for his coming. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. The book of Isaiah is a very long book. If you open the Old Testament, chances are you're going to hit that or Jeremiah or Psalms because those are the longest ones. 66 chapters. And although the prophet Isaiah tells us and gives us some of the most pristine, amazing promises and details of the coming Savior and His saving work, the majority of the book of Isaiah isn't very pleasant to read. In fact, the very first part of it, chapters 1 through 39 is the first part of the book. It is pretty much filled with the rebellion of God's people against him. It is filled with the destruction and the promise of God's judgment against his people for their rebellion. The verses of chapter 1 paint the picture very well for us. Ah, oh, so sinful nation. A people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. And then chapter 39 closes the first half of the book of Isaiah with the imminent oncoming of the Babylonian armies to carry off God's people into exile and destroy their cities and lands. Not a very pleasant picture, is it? Which makes the words we have here for us today so striking. Comfort, comfort. Painted on a picture. Sin and destruction. Comfort, comfort. What do you do when you want to get somebody's attention? Well, you repeat things, right? You say it more than once because it's important. 
Or if we're children and we want to get our parents to listen to us, yes, we can yell, but what do we do? We say it over and over and over and over and over and over again, right? Or if we want to get our spouse to do something, we leave notes all over the place, on the refrigerator, on the nightstand, bathroom mirror, they're all over the place, right? You get the point when something's repeated. We have comfort. Comfort, why? Because it's such a desperately needed comfort. And why is it such comfort? There are two little words that we have in English. There are a couple dots and lines in the Hebrew. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Why is comfort so desperately needed by God's people? Because overwhelming has been the sin and the rebellion of God's people against him. Overwhelming for God's people has been the consequences of that sin, the destruction and the devastation of the cities and the land and the countrysides. Overwhelming the thoughts that that land to which was connected the promise to Abraham doesn't belong to the children of Abraham anymore. Overwhelming the thought that there is no son of David who is sitting on the throne either. Overwhelming the thought that God has forsaken his promise to his people. Overwhelming that it seems as if God's people are no longer God's people. Comfort is so desperate. As we know and understand the nature and the destruction of sin in the lives of God's people. Sin overwhelms and terrorizes the hearts of God's people in many ways at many times. It could be when the curse of sin, the things that happen to us in life because of sin overwhelm and terrorize us. When we have those diagnoses that we don't want to hear. And we endure the treatment that our toll will make us better. We look into the eyes of elderly parents whose personality has been destroyed by dementia. Overwhelming. What sin does in the hearts and lives of God's people. Overwhelming and and terrorizing our hearts. The sins of others that are, that are done against us, meant to hurt and harm us, to take what, that which is ours. Overwhelming and terrorizing is the sin. Maybe our own sin. The same sins that we get so easily entangled up into and the guilt that it causes in our hearts we know that this is not what God's people are supposed to do and the greatest terror and the most overwhelming part of it is that when sin terrorizes the heart of God's people in this way that there seems to be no relief that there is never going to be an end and make us wonder are God's people still God's people Desperately needed comfort. Comfort. When sin terrorizes and overwhelms the hearts of God's people, the only answer is overwhelming comfort. And where is the comfort? My people. Says your Although it seems as if sin has terrorized and destroyed everything, still, my people, despite what you have done, I'm still your God. Although they rejected me. Comfort, comfort, such desperately needed comfort that comes from the hand of God that no sinner deserves. And why is this comfort that we're still God's people? God's people are still God's people. He's still their God. Because her hard service has been completed. The terror of sin ends when the Savior comes. How is that? Their sins are paid for. The 
terror of sin can only come with the end of sin. And that's what the Savior brings when He comes. The end, the terror of sin. He comes as a virgin just as promised. Incarnate of the Holy Spirit as we confess. Wrapping Himself in our human flesh so that he not sin, yet become sin for us and bear the curse of sin for us to pay for each and every one of our sins. Comfort. Comfort so desperately needed. Comfort. In the hand of our God when the Savior comes. The end of sin. And she will receive from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That almost seems bad at first because means I'm getting twice you know, what I deserve for my sin. That's not what it means, though. That as the sin is now ended, we receive even more from the Lord. Comfort and comfort, and we could say, blessings upon blessings. Now and forevermore. Desperately needed comfort we have when the Savior comes to us, because sin ends we have so much to look forward to when the Savior comes and brings us this comfort. And we don't want to miss it, so it is our Advent duty to get ready for His coming when He brings such comfort. This is the time we're preparing everything, right? We're preparing the Christmas cards, we're preparing the meals, we're preparing lines for Christmas uh, services and and we're preparing songs for the Christmas programs. We're just get, everything's pre- getting prepared right now, right? We must prepare ourselves and our hearts for the Savior's coming. How are we going to do that? The voice of one calling. In the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged place is a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. All mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. When the children of Israel were carried off into exile in Babylon, they didn't take the, law, they didn't take the short way. The short way to Babylon Street, the straight east, right? The straight east would have been right across the desert, the wilderness. They didn't go that way, it was too dangerous. Even the exiles went the long way, big arch. Through the Fertile Crescent, between the Tigris and the Euphrates River before they were brought to their new home then in Babylon. But now when the promise of the Lord comes to bring His people back, to deliver His people from their bondage, He ain't going to take the long way. He's not going to take the way that's going to take the longest amount of time. He's going to get there and He's going to get there now. When he comes to deliver his people, he has taken the superhighway straight across the wilderness to bring his people back. And in order for that to happen, every obstacle must be removed. Every mountain made low, every valley raised up, so the Lord can get there as quickly as possible to deliver his people. And we, as his people, certainly don't want his, delayed, want his coming delayed. We certainly don't want the joy of his coming diminished in any way. So too, then, the way must be prepared. And all obstacles must be removed as we await His coming. And as we think, what possibly could stand in the way? What could there possibly be in our lives that would be an obstacle to the coming of the Lord or would cause us distraction if the Lord comes? Well, there's a lot of other things that demand our attention this time of year, right? Things that are very important, but not as important as His coming. Maybe we're distracted. Yeah, we'll do the church thing, but we've got a lot of other things on our minds right now. Maybe it's all the planning and the prep. How are we going to fit everybody in the dining room? Are we going to have enough food? That's a really large package under the tree. I wonder what's in it. Shake it a little bit. Maybe the, maybe the obstacle that's before us is, is one of indifference. What's the big deal anyways? Everybody does it for the wrong reasons. Or I've done it for the past 60, 70 years. No different than the last one or the one before that a decade ago. Perhaps the obstacle might be the reason for which John the Baptist came. 
a lack of repentance, realizing how desperately we need the Savior to come. And so we ready ourselves, removing every obstacle, removing every distraction before His coming, our hearts and our minds. We don't let the quiet times in these next few weeks get crowded out by all the noise and dizziness. We'll light the candles and sing those ancient songs that drive deeply into our hearts the divine mystery and miracles of the Savior's coming. And we prepare ourselves in true repentance. Recognizing what our sin has done. What our sin is. The Savior comes knowing that when he comes, he brings with him the end of the sin. And so we prepare ourselves, not wanting to miss out. When he brings that end of sin, that comfort, comfort, we so desperately, desperately need. And when he comes, we have so much to look forward. Amen. Please stand. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. With one heart and one voice, let's join our, our voices together to confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Please stand. Let us join in the responsive prayer of the church printed in the service folder. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. For your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John, 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of lords. Lift up our hearts in joyful anticipation of that day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We sing hymn number 702, Prepare the Royal Highway. It is printed for you in the service folder. <laughs> Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and inwardly digest them, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. Hymn number 13, there's a voice in the wilderness crying. <laughs> 